Hello again. We're here for our fifth and final archaeology coffee hour. I'm Elizabeth Reitz from the Office of the State Archaeologist here with Brennan Dolan, who will be interviewing Mike Perry today. So I'm going to disappear and let these fellas do their thing. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, as this is our final interview installment for Iowa Archaeology Month, Elizabeth, I just want you to know on behalf of the society how much we appreciate your efforts. Uh, you know, obviously this year has been a, a tough one, and I think that we were able to pull off some pretty pretty great uh, Iowa Archaeology Month content thanks to yourself. So, um, as Elizabeth said, I am Brennan Dolan. Uh, I am an archaeologist in the state, a member of the society. I've had the good fortune to work for the Iowa DOT for uh, be 10 years this year, and before that for the State Historic Preservation Office. And I've had the good fortune to know Mr. Perry for a number of years. Uh, so Mike, if you could, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, where are you from? Where are your roots? Uh, thank you, Brennan, for asking me to do this is uh, quite an honor for me. I, I ne certainly never would have expected I'd be counted among these uh, these greats of Iowa archaeology here, but uh, uh, um, I'm originally from Ames, although I was born in Iowa City and I have come back to Iowa City uh, and been here now most of my life, I think. So I consider myself Iowa City and now um, uh, I grew up in Ames, though, and uh, uh, went to school at Iowa State University, uh, studied anthropology under Dr. Dr. Bauer, um, and graduated in 1976 with my bachelor's degree. Uh, that was as far as I got uh, uh, with my formal. Of course, I've never stopped learning, and um, uh, I had the good fortune to join the Office of the State Archaeologist in 1980. And uh, after a, a long career there, I retired in, uh, 19, or in 2016. And uh, I still maintain my connection there. I keep, uh, I'm an adjunct researcher at the office. And um, uh, I'm allowed to keep my desk and I can come in when I, when I please and leave when I please. <laughs> uh, that sounds like an ideal setup. Of, uh, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't trade it. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so you mentioned Dr. Bauer. Um, who else would have been at ISU at that time, Mike, when you were coming through? And I, I assume Ishwal was up well, and running during those years. Oh, I, oh yes, uh, oh yes. Um, um, well, let's see, Nancy Osborne was uh, Dr. Gradwell's uh, uh, right hand uh, in, the, in running, running the issue all. As far as other anthropology professors, uh, Mike Warren was there, Mike Whiteford was there. Um, and I'm trying to think of a few other. Patton was one of my instructors. She wasn't a professor. Uh, Bill Ringel was another instructor. Uh, um, that I had, so I think that's most of them in the in the department at that time. Um, Bauer, Dr. Bauer, joined the faculty uh, uh, during my junior year, and uh, uh, so uh, the department grew over the over the years while I was there. Uh, sure. Well, well, Mike, this is kind of a, a, a must-ask question for this series, but what pulled you into, into anthropology? I mean, were you a business major, but, uh, you know, you, you, got, you got a taste of archaeology? Were you a science kind of person? What, what was it about anthropology, anthropology that pulled you in? Oh, no, uh, I've always, I think I've always been interested in the ancient world. Um, uh, I, I uh, uh, occasionally, while well, we'd take trips, the family would take trips down to the to the state historical building in Des Moines. The, that's the old state historical museum building, which is north of now. The new one, of course, is to the 
is to the west of the Capitol. Uh, uh, but we would go to the historical building every now and then uh, just because we liked going. Uh, my favorite room, of course, in the, the old historical building was the third floor west, which was the room that had all the fossils and all the, facts, all the, all the Native American artifacts. And, uh, well, and unfortunately, all the burial uh, burials that were on display back then as well. Uh, but that was my, uh, one of the trips that we had down there, uh, 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 Jack Musgrove, who was the who was the director of the museum, was uh, there in the uh, in the ancient history room um, and told us about the um, uh, the crosses found at the West Des Moines burial site, um, which I thought was a very good shell. story. And I, you know, I, I just thought, well, you know, I got to, yeah, there were shell crosses. Uh, uh, and of course, that's not necessarily the. He thought they were Christian crosses. I, I, I don't think that's exactly what they represent. But, and they, I think Lynn, Alex, and Joe, Tiffany have pretty well figured out what's going on with those. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, it was, it was fascinating to me. And uh, at Ames High, I was fortunate. Uh, uh, they, because uh, they offered anthropology at the high school level, at least cultural. Anyway, and I took that class really um, the first year, first year that it was offered, and, and um, decided, well, I'm I'm going to have to major in anthropology. That's just all there is to it. Uh, that had so, to be a little bit of an outlier. And I was happy to go. Uh, I, if any other high schools were doing that at the same time, might have been a few, but certainly not many very not very many in Iowa. Uh, sure. Thanks for that. Okay, so OSA 1980, after you graduated, was there um, was there any possibility that Mike Perry uh, spent his career someplace other than OSA? Had, were, what were job prospects like when you oh, graduated? Yeah. Well, not I. Uh, I was I was. Uh, my means were rather limited after our graduation, and I stayed around Ames, and I did a stint in the restaurant business. I don't know if you ever been to if you've ever been to Aunt Maud's restaurant there for a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> it was I I believe that's under different management from when I was there, but uh, uh, that was that was uh, uh, immediately after graduation. But uh, uh, eventually, that kind of wears out, you know. And uh, 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 it, I decided about 1980, 1980 uh, it's time to maybe see if I can get going in archaeology again. And I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, knew some of the, the people at the OSA, uh, um, and uh, uh, positions were opening up. Uh, um, and uh, I, I went ahead and applied, and I was, I, I was taken in. Without without much hesitation, I hope. Uh, 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 so, uh, I, and I never looked back after that. So, uh, but before that, you know, uh, before graduating, I worked at Ames Ames Ice and Fuel. I did I did several years there, packaging up ice. Uh, um, I don't think that operation anymore. Uh, uh, package ice. Uh, Deliver fuel for, especially out at Pamel Court, um, uh, where married student housing was at the time, um, and uh, it, it was it was a lot of uh, different kinds of jobs there with that outfit, and I went I like years for that. Um, um, then there was my so first field season. Um, uh, which was I, I had volunteered uh, to, to go along with the uh, Iowa State University Field School on a trip down to Kansas uh, uh, right after I graduated. You know, behind every aspiring archaeologist is a mother who knows how to use the telephone. 
And my mother called up the anthropology department at Iowa State uh, uh, late, late in your years, about May, you know, getting close to graduation. And she knew of my interest, of course. And she called up the department and uh, they patched her see Osborne. And my mother said, well, I've got my son here who's interested in archaeology and we're wondering what kind of opportunities might be available this summer that he could he could uh, and nancy says well we, you know we got this field school coming up and let me talk to dr gradwall uh, um, and uh, uh, she did that and uh, dr gradwall had said well have mike give me a call uh, and we'll talk about it and so a few days later i guess i called him up uh, we spoke on the phone briefly, and he invited me to his house uh, on Lynn Street at the time uh, and on a Saturday morning. Uh, that Saturday came, and I found his house. I'd never been there, of course, uh, uh, and uh, found him out back planting his flowers uh, in the garden um, and... Uh, uh, he, I walked up to him and he held out his hand, of course, and said, said hi, I'm Dave Gregg. Um, and we uh, shook hands and chatted for a little bit. And he invited me indoors and uh, I met his wife, Hannah, and uh, she poured us some iced tea, nice chat that morning. And um, uh, uh, after I left, then he said, well, I'll be in touch. And uh, a few days later, he called up and said, well, Welcome aboard, you know, go to Kansas. We're going to be here, you know, be, be at East Hall, you know, 7.30 on a Saturday morning. <laughs> uh, we'll get you down there, bring us. Uh, uh, we'll be there for eight weeks. Uh, oh, wow. It'll cost We're about so down in Kansas. Room right? and board. Uh, uh, it was about halfway between Kansas City and Lawrence. They were working on a new freeway there. And now that freeway is, oh, okay. of course, in place. Uh, uh, but it was in advance of the freeway. And um, there was a site that was going to go through. Uh, the, well, it was going to be taken out by the, um, by the new freeway. We needed uh, data recovery work, basically. And so we, we spent several weeks uh, excavating there. We also did. Um, survey work basically we did the whole thing uh, got to learn how to find artifacts got to learn how to excavate got to learn how to map all of that stuff and it, it was it was quite an education for me so you you had a you had a taste of transportation pretty early on then Yeah, although it didn't mean it didn't mean much to us at that time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, they right. just mentioned that this is where the freeway was going. We we didn't care to to do the digging. That's what we were wanting to do. Right. So right. we didn't care what what the reason was. <laughs> but there were so other areas forward. along the highway corridor. Out later, there was other areas sure. on the highway corridor where we had to work, and so we were doing survey and we were doing testing and such. Uh, and it was all part of that field school. And there was class sure. work, work and lab work and all. So uh, sure. uh, quite the experience. So, so fast forward 1980, you find yourself as a new hire over at the OSA. Um, and I'm going to jump to one mm -hmm. of the questions I really wanted to ask you. Is it true that you've right. done survey work in all 99 of Iowa's counties? Is that a myth you know, or sure is it a that fact? Rumor got, that's a myth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that's a myth, Brennan. Uh, uh, although I have certainly worked in most of the county. There are a few, I think, that I have not actually worked in. Now, I've probably been okay. through them all one way or another, but uh, I there are a few, I think, that I actually never did. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, I, And I'm not sure how that got started, but. Uh, I'll lay that to rest now. 
<laughs> okay. Well, th I think our viewership I very much appreciates. If you look through, through all my reports, you probably yeah. If you look through all my reports, I um, it, you there's enough of them all over. You'd think, I suppose, you'd think <laughs> I've been in every county. Uh, uh, so I can see how that maybe would have come around. Okay, so just a little basic research. Um, records indicate that you've completed over 700 or contributed to lead author or, or supporting author over 700 archaeological surveys in your 36 career, um, over a thousand recorded sites or updated site inventory forms. Mike, that's a substantial contribution to Iowa archaeology. What, you know, when you got to 2016, and you had a little time to look backward. What what did some of those numbers mean to you? You know, I never kept track of the ports or the number of sites. <laughs> uh, so it, that's just the way it is, I guess. You know. Sure. Uh, and I, I'm I'm at the top of the list when it comes to the number of of uh, of reports or sites. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, there's, there's probably others who. So I, I want to share a quick story. I was talking to a colleague um, the other day. Um, just you know, some of the challenges of this year and and being connected to the society and what we're going to do for our Iowa Archaeology Month. Talked about the interview series and then mentioned that I was interviewing you, and um, I mm -hmm. I think you're a fairly humble. Uh, dude, so I won't ask you to comment on this, but uh, the thesis of my uh, uh, discussion as to who I was interviewing was that um, you are to Iowa archaeology as Cal Ripken Jr. is to baseball. Baseball's <laughs> Iron Man who competed in 2,600 plus <laughs> consecutive games. You've completed 700 plus archaeology archaeological mm -hmm. surveys. You know, I, I really, I, I mean that sincerely, all joking aside, you know, someone who well, uh, touches transportation work on a daily basis. Mike, I rarely go a day where I don't see your name somewhere. And, and I always know that it's a substantial uh, contribution. So, so well, hopefully, <laughs> I don't know if you I, like that. It's, it's a, it's a, thank you for that honor. Uh, <laughs> and I hope that whatever you see, my name is 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 worthy of the praise that you're giving me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's 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 take a little different turn here with my next question. Um, you've got a reputation for uh, someone who knows how to lead a good survey, and uh, I'll review my source on that uh, insight. That would have been Mr. Doug Jones, who you and I both worked with for a few years, uh, a, a good colleague, but. Um, in your opinion, what makes a good survey, Mike? Well, I would agree with this. The first thing you want is a, is a good lunch place about five minutes away. <laughs> that makes a good survey. Certainly helps. So you, logistics, right? number one. <laughs> <laughs> lunch. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, uh, I every every project that you might work on is going to be different from the next so uh, what you might do on one project uh you wouldn't necessarily another one uh, um and uh the kinds of methods that would uh you would use say in um north central iowa where there's a lot of cold and there's not much potential for anything deeply buried you might simply use a lot of pedestrian work and it would probably be perfectly acceptable but that approach wouldn't work anywhere else uh, especially in uh, the larger river valleys where there's a good chance that something is going to get buried and then you need to start digging holes well you know and of course there's different kinds of holes uh, with different kinds of tools and i always figure well uh, if you if you use all all the tools in the tool, uh, then you've done probably a pretty thorough job, uh, regardless of where you're working. 
Uh, but it seems like you know, in the later years, especially after, uh, uh, especially after about 1990, uh, 1995 or so, we were digging a lot of holes where it seemed like. And earlier on, we weren't doing so much of that. Uh, that's one mm -hmm. of the kind of the changes that I've seen. Um, um, well, that, that actually that's that's kind of feeds into one of my questions, Mike. You know, during your career, Iowa saw a major transition with the rollout of the geomorph guidelines. I know from seeing a lot of the reports you've written over the years, um, you know, you were able to spend a lot of field time with folks like Art Bettis. Obviously, uh, Joe Arts for a lot of your career was just down the hallway. Could you talk a little bit about what um, you know, what was a practitioner's firsthand view or experience of of watching the profession grow and really um, kind of self-educate toward doing better survey work in the context of, of recognizing what geomorphology means to finding sites? Uh, you know, I, we, we started learning stuff during my uh, work at Sailorville Res Reservoir. Uh, Art Bettis was there and Larry Abbott, they were both big influences on me. Um, we started finding deeply buried remains uh, out there in the Des Moines River Valley uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the reservoir. And uh, we were starting to learn what, uh, what we needed to be looking for. Uh, it took a while uh, uh, till we were able to kind of develop a decent level of how, you know, how uh, river valleys form and how their, uh, in, their, their sediments are interrelated uh, um, and uh, how old they might be and what their potential is for containing archaeological remains. So it, it was an process and it was probably mid 80s, mid to late 80s before we really had a fairly good handle on that. And that's mostly thanks to, to Dr. Bettis. Um, um, but, uh, you know, uh, Joe Arts once said, uh, you know, you, you go out and you be an archaeologist, it means digging holes and, and working with it. And pretty soon you start to learn how to recognize different landforms and different ages of sediments uh, based on soil characteristics. Uh, that's, that's what I tried to focus my efforts on um, when I was doing the, this kind of work. And it, it seems to have paid off um, because I, I, could, I could actually find things <laughs> uh, uh, once in a while when, when uh, I, I would do that. So uh, um, it, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to dig into some of those classic publications or to read the guidelines, but uh, you know, you, you were in the field um, kind of learning and formulating those methods and revising. And, and that's, I think that's the kind of information that I always appreciate learning. All right, let me ask one more question in regard to survey methodology, and then we're gonna to switch to uh, another uh, line of questions. But um, we talked about okay. what makes a good survey. What, what? I know you've trained various OSA staffers over the years. What's a pitfall uh, someone new to survey work would fall into from time to time? What would be a piece of advice you would give them to, to stay away from? Uh, pitfalls. Well, <laughs> um, just not being prepared for, uh, for what you might run or being able to, to, to do the kind of work that you need to be able to do to, to complete the job properly. I, I think that's the biggest thing. Some uh, coming here with expectations that this is going to be easy. Uh, 
and we don't have to do any hard work uh, uh, is probably get themselves frustrated. Uh, sure. Uh, because believe me, none of this has ever been easy for me. It's, it's, it's been, it's all, well, get back. The, the work itself is physically hard, but at the same time, the actual work itself is not that difficult. Uh, uh, once you've done it a few times, you've got it down. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, um, so, so the biggest pitfall, I think, is, you know, people with expectations that this is going to be easy and it's not. And mm -hmm. how, how does yeah, that it's... grab you? No, I, I think that's like a great that the right track there. <laughs> I think that's a great response because, you know, a lot of ways, our ability to work with the resource, to understand it, you know, in its horizontal and vertical context really does come down to being prepared. So, no, I, I all right, this right. is kind of my four fun section of questioning today. So these are kind of rapid fire, all right? Um, so we've right. dispelled the 99 county <laughs> myth, but we also know you've been all over the state. So. Give me a favorite restaurant and or dish um, when you're out and about. Uh, this is the kind of place you might drive 20 minutes out of your way to stop and stop and, and eat at. Uh, you know, I never really had favorites. <laughs> no? Uh, <laughs> as long as it was, no, you know, uh, not... Uh, well, you know, I like going to Dubuque. They have, you could eat in a different Italian restaurant every night for a week <laughs> in Dubuque. Um, and I'm not talking about the Pizza Hut or the, or, or even the Olive Garden. You could go to a different Italian place in Dubuque every night for a week. It's great. I like doing that. Uh, um, but, um, and I always like going to Des Moines because there's such a, it's, you know, that's the biggest town. It's got the best selection of anything to eat that you might want. So that's always nice if you don't got a sure. got a good selection of places to choose from. Uh, uh, but most of the work is never in <laughs> the best of locations. And uh, you get into small town Iowa and you just you, you take what you get and you don't complain. <laughs> uh, all right, so you've literally for, for the veg I, I was going to say I always felt bad for the vegetarians because uh, every <laughs> once in a while there'd be one, and of course they're going to have a hard time in small town Iowa. Uh, but uh, we 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 got through it. So you've literally dug thousands of shovel tests across your career. Real quick, uh, give me a give me a favorite field snack to help keep your energy up. I'm sorry, you you broke up. You broke up there a little bit. Can you, can you uh, favorite the field snack? Favorite field. Chewing gum. Okay. Um, last one of these. Best mental remedy for a tough field day. Uh. Well, there were a number of years there where a, where a cold beer after work was always nice, uh, uh, but I kind of gave that up a, uh, uh, in favor of just a good night's sleep. Nothing beats <laughs> that. Favorite, real quick here, favorite Beatles album? <laughs> uh uh, you know, for a long time, uh, the first one, the uh, uh, Meet the Beatles, was a very favorite of mine. Uh, but uh, uh, they're all, they're all, uh, you know, right up there. I think, uh, and certainly the White Album is, is 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 near the top, and Abbey Road near the top. And I think a lot of people would say the same thing. Um. <clears throat> 
Let's talk about, um, you know, Mike, one of the things that's always stuck out to me about you is uh, just the breadth of sites you've worked with, whether that was something that might be connected to um, a transportation project or maybe a private collection. Uh, I think you've done a great job across your career of working with some avocational folks and um, really donating a lot of time toward private collections. But uh, tell us about a favorite site or a data set that you've really enjoyed, something that really stuck out to you. Oh, I still always uh, will take Glenwood over anything else. Uh, um, that's uh, something that I've been into for, because that even my first field school after high school was a Central Plains Earth Lodge site that we worked on. So I got a taste of geology very early and um, I still enjoy working with the Glenwood material whenever I get the chance. Right. Um, and you've spent the last couple of years I, working on I, some of that stuff too, right? We're, you know, we're trying to uh, reanalyze all the Highway 30 uh, excavation data. It was never, as you know, probably never properly written up. Um, and uh, we're still learning stuff. Uh, uh, you know, uh, new dates come out. We're going to change probably the, 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 the dating for the, for that is of occupation, uh, um, um, details about the lodges themselves are, are, are emerging that we never really realized. New sites, we've, we've, we've recorded several new sites out of this uh, that were never actually recorded before. Uh, um, you know, proper lithic and, and ceramic analyses were never really completed. Uh, and that's always going to have new information in, in them. So there's plenty of uh, data to be or information to be mined from the from the from the database there in Glenwood. Uh, um. Um, one of the questions that I had. Well, let's do this one. Mike, name name one of the name an archaeologist or other professional that's been really influential to you on your career or, or a small group of them? Uh, my biggest influences, you mean? Uh, 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 well, I, of course, I can't for you all uh, for pointing me in the right direction, sort of. Um, and um, uh, certainly Dr. Bauer was another influence, but... Uh, um, field itself, you know, uh, I've already mentioned Bettis and, and Abbott. Um, um, one of the grads at Iowa State when I was there was um, Jeff Flenniken. Um, and uh, he was, he had an influence on me. And uh, 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 the director of the field who, uh, um, in Kansas, uh, John Reynolds, uh, uh, who was the first anthropology graduates to have graduated. Uh, uh, and uh, he, you know, he taught me how to use a shovel. Uh, um, and uh, um, so he was certainly a big influence. So there's, 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 but I would say, you know, to be fair, practically everybody I've known at the Office of the State Archaeology just has been an influence uh, uh, in one way or another. Uh, 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 so there you go. <laughs> um, one of the experiences when I was sitting down to think about, you know, what, what I'd want to ask you, one of the things that um, really stuck out in my memory was, uh, I believe it was an Association of Iowa Archaeologists meeting um, and I want to say maybe late 2000s, you had invited um, Wynamia Morris, Omaha historian and, uh, and uh, researcher. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your interactions with her or how you got to know her. 
Uh, Wanima was uh, presenting something, I think, at the Iowa Museum Association meetings, uh, uh, some sort of meeting like that. Uh, um, and I attended that conference and um, heard her speak. And afterward, I introduced myself to and we chatted for a while. and. Uh, decided, well, you know, we can stay in touch once in a while. We'll maybe get together if we can. Uh, and um, uh, I've actually had relatively few interactions with her beyond that. I mean, we, can't, we had her come to Iowa City one time and uh, uh, emailed with her recently, but that's about it. Okay. Um, so... Um, hypothetical here for you. If you were able to launch a new research program tomorrow, what would you work on uh, and who would you collaborate with? Who would I, well, uh, you know, um, what we need, one thing we need to do is get all of Ellison maps uh, into GIS, um, just so that it makes them a little bit easier to work with in the modern world. Um, um, and um, that in itself, he, he, he was, Joe Tiffany said one time, he was a constant, and he made a, excuse me, he made a lot of them. Uh, um, and getting all that done, is, it would be a, a, a sizable project. Uh, uh, but if it could be, it would certainly be a big help to, you know, making uh, the rest of his data a little more amenable to modern research, I think. So that's one, one thing. I still think there's plenty of information to be learned uh, from the local collections in local museums uh, through and getting into those collections and giving them proper cataloging and you know that sort of thing kind of recording whatever we can in terms of site look might be available with that is another project that ought to probably be continued here i've made a little bit of inroad with that but i don't know all the collections might be or how useful they are of course everything is going to be different but um all the collections that I have worked with so far have yielded something new to us, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, new fluted points that we didn't know about or new sites that need to be recorded or something like that. So there's, there's, there's information out there that needs to be found. Uh, um, and it's just a matter of tracking down these, these collections and figuring out them. Mike, for someone who may not have heard a presentation you've given over the years about uh, one of the collections you've worked with, just give us an example of how you've worked through maybe getting to know some of the, the local um, components of a collection, maybe a private landowner or a collector or a museum, and, and how do you work that into, um, you know, kind of a... Um, professionally uh, curated assemblage that, that does help us learn something new about that. Paint us, paint us the picture. Give us, give us an example of one of the collections you've worked with. Well, you know, Russ Campbell from Humboldt, Iowa, um, was a pretty diligent one. Um, he, he developed his own catalog. I, I only met him before he passed away, although I had heard about him. Uh, um, um, Dwayne Anderson knew about him, and, and some of the others, of course, had, had, had worked with him. There was one uh, fellow who was working back when Nick Husick was the archaeologist, state archaeologist. Um, staff worked very closely with Russ, taught him the finer points of cataloging and um, documenting sites and that sort of thing. And Russ was pretty about the work that he did. And he 
um, he left us a, a very nice collection. Um, not all of the catalog, but certainly the majority, uh, along with um, maps and and uh, descriptions of the material that he had found from uh, the sites that he collected off of. Um, so he was an excellent example and a great place to start uh, working with this kind of collection. Now, not every collector went to that length that he, he's probably unusual in that respect. Um, there was another fellow that I had heard about, never actually met, uh, Tom Royster uh, from Muscatine, Iowa. I had heard a story fr about him uh, from one of the um, one of the county uh, um, naturalists at one town there and talked to that guy. He had told me about this guy Royster, who is a collector all up and down the Mississippi River. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, his collection ended up in the hands of Washington County. Uh, the museum uh, at the is the, is the Conger House, it's the Washington County Historical Society, uh, um, and the the collection is there at the at that museum. And um, uh, they, they they invited to do a proper cataloging on it. Uh, now, of course, he hadn't really provided the kind of documentation that you might want, um, but nonetheless, uh, a, a, an interesting project, and I think we got something out of it. And I think Washington County uh, Historical Society was was very pleased with what we did. We gave them new exhibits based mm -hmm. on the material that he had recovered, um, gave them the whole timeline of prehistoric culture in Iowa and that they were very happy with what what they had what, what they got from us considering what it, the state of what it was in uh, when we came to visit uh, right uh, approached us about it uh, so um, you know I, I met a number of collectors around the state uh, in my travels um, um, you know, and and probably most of them didn't have any kind of uh, work done on their collections, and uh, right. probably weren't particularly interested in sharing, you know, a lot of information about it. Because people, you know, really into this, they they tend to keep those locations to themselves and. Uh, just because there's a lot of other people out there and they don't like competition. You know, <laughs> you know it's, it's hard to make inroads. It's hard to make inroads with those people, but the ones that end up with their collections donated to local museums, right. they're a little bit, a bit more amenable to, to, sure. to that kind of investigative work. So uh, um, sure. That's uh, well, does that does that help? I am I yeah, no, I, I think that's good. That's insightful. Um, that's kind of what I was hoping for. Um, all right, we've got just a little time left before we transition to some of the questions we might have from our viewing audience today. I'm going to probe you for some tales of the trade, Mr. Perry. Um, would you have a field story you would mind sharing? with us that might uh, cover a scary topic like some threatening weather or unruly livestock or maybe being chased off of a property by a landowner with a firearm. Um, I suspect you've got a story uh, or two. Well, you know, to be honest, Brennan, I've been pretty lucky <laughs> um, and never much trouble. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I did get into one pasture one time, and I was warned about the bull that was out there. Um, and, and I got about halfway across the pasture, and uh, uh, he spotted me, and I and didn't like the look on him. I, and he was still some distance, but he, he didn't seem to like me, and I didn't push the issue. And I decided, oh, I'll just come back to this another time. <laughs> uh, 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 now we worked 
at, in Sailorville, we worked in trenches, backhoe trenches that were way over our heads, excavated units way over our heads. Uh, and today we, we wouldn't dream of doing that because uh, uh, of the danger of collapse, you know. Um, everybody hears about the, the worker who gets trapped in a, in a trench that's not properly shored up, you know. We never gave it a second thought. Um, <laughs> and yeah, those trenches collapsed too, but nobody was ever in them when it happened. <laughs> uh, so right. I was lucky on, on that score. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we didn't like rain, so the, the weather never really was much of an issue to us. Uh, there was one time, early spring, we were down near Atumwa, um, and uh, we were working in one field, and it was it was a dry spell, and fire danger was a problem at that time. And the field, maybe a quarter mile away, caught fire. Uh, oh wow! Uh, it we were upwind, fortunately, uh, mm -hmm. but. Uh, um, so we, we weren't re any in re any real danger from that, but, uh, you know, that's something that I had never expected might happen, but, but sure enough, you know, the cornfield, it was, of course it was, it had been harvested, but the stubble still catches on fire. There's, there's my cat come to visit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't turn away any viewers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, last question. I think we've got just enough time to squeeze this okay. one in. You've had some characters on your cruise over the years. Uh, is there a story you could share with us, maybe about a young Doug Jones or uh, an Ed Vega story or something like that? Uh, you know, here's a, here's a Doug story. We were Does it involve Sasquatch? Highway... <laughs> no. Uh, we were working in 1992. We were working in the fall uh, down in Washington County near Kelowna. Uh, um, Highway 22, actually, I guess it was. And uh, it was just him and I that day. Um, and we were out digging. And this guy had spotted us couple times probably because we'd been this for several weeks already uh, and he decided to come out and pay us a visit uh, um, and um, we we were talking about what's going on here and all, uh, we we kind of got to a quiet point and I you know that, that was the election year and I said to the guy uh, uh, well who are you gonna uh, <laughs> And at the time, Doug, uh, Doug and I had talked about that, and he said, "I'm one. I'm going to vote for Perot. Ray, I, I don't like Clinton, and I don't like Bush, and uh, I'm going to vote for Perot. He sounds more like my kind of guy." So I, said, so I said to this this visitor, "I'm going to vote for," and the guy says to me, uh, 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 "Well, since you asked me straight out, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to vote for Perot." <laughs> and we just laughed because I was obviously in the minority that day. <laughs> uh, well, Doug, Doug very rarely would uh, keep so his opinions to himself. So that sounds right on par. Sometimes, sometimes he would. Not... <laughs> uh, so. How are we All doing? Right. We got I any questions with... from, the, from the audience? Yeah, I want to check with Elizabeth. I've got a few more, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask too. Hey there. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions, mostly from oh, colleagues. Okay. All right. Uh, John Dorschick was wondering, this is back when you were talking about working at OSA in the early 80s, who, who else was working there? Who else was working there? 
Well, I'm not sure I can remember everybody. Um, uh, Dwayne Anderson was state archaeologist when I was hired, and he was there till 85, I guess. Uh, and Joe Tiffany was the the assistant director, associate director. Steve Lensink was there. Um, uh, the highway staff at the time, uh, Chip Reed and Ricky Atwell, uh, 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 Lou Ann Hudson joined us uh, in the early 80s. Uh, she had just graduated from the University of Iowa. Uh, Chris Hurst, same thing. Uh, Billick I came along a couple years later. Uh, uh, so uh, let's see. Debbie Zaglowski was the site records clerk. Uh, uh, we had a we had an archivist at the time. It was before Julie Hoyer came, and I can't remember who that archivist was. Uh, there was an editor, uh, and I want to say Denise, uh, and I can't remember her last name. Um, helping to produce, uh, you know, uh, uh, OSA reports at the time. Um, and um, uh, when I had just arrived, uh, John Hotop was still on staff. He was on his way out the door, though. Uh, uh, I got to know him a little bit before he left. But uh, uh, so there's there's some some of the old timers. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. lots of familiar names. Uh, your colleagues seem to know you well, and Brennan's already brought this up. So Bill Green is commenting on your love of food as well. <laughs> and you kind of touched on it, but anything about your research methods with, you know, did you actually write a guide uh, to eateries uh, or is this hearsay? I sure didn't. No, I, I sure <laughs> never wrote anything about it. But if we're myth busting today. <laughs> You know, if there were some place specific, they could ask me if I had any recommendations on a specific location, uh, which I would do from time to time. But uh, um, I, I never, I never uh, produced a, a definitive guide, shall we say? <laughs> you know, when I worked for the Wisconsin Historical Society doing highway work, I actually legitimately thought about creating a food guide. Uh huh. It's a good way uh, to well, keep occupied on the road. Yeah. <laughs> Iowa somebody's needs one. Done that. <laughs> hey, from Lance Foster, he really enjoyed your landscape right. approach to archaeology. So what are your thoughts on encouraging other archaeologists to take that view or approach? Well, you know, one thing Dr. Gradwell always stressed was that it's a good idea to take some geology classes when you're in school. And I that's... Uh, and I did that, um, and I, I I tell students if I get the opportunity to do the same thing, uh, um, and uh, uh, you know, take some soil science classes while you're at it too. Uh, 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 that's 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 always helpful. So, um, uh, I hope that answers the question for Lance. Uh, uh, yeah, he did reference your Greenbelt article. Greenbelt article. I mean, you've uh, written, that was, what, 700, thinking, so? I, he's thinking, I think, of Jim Collins' Greenbelt, okay. uh, Iowa Greenbelt survey, and there's a special publication that came out because of that. But I. I didn't do anything with the with the green belt as he as he says. I don't can't say that I I I, I that's one of the areas I never uh, got to work in was that Iowa River green belt. So another myth, another myth busted. <laughs> um, so I wasn't the first to admire your bookshelf. Uh, any pieces behind <laughs> you that are your particular favorite or have a good story? Uh, there, I like I like them all. Uh, you know, there's uh, Papago baskets. Uh, there are um, Pueblo various Pueblo pots. Um, I've got uh, uh, Akama 
um, uh, uh, what are the names of them? I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, Laguna, I've got a Laguna pot. I've got, um, um, oh, I can't. There's so many of them, I can't think of all the names. Several of them are Akama. Uh, I somewhere have a Zia. I think I got a Zia Pueblo pot up there. Uh, um, um, there's a few others. Uh, most of the it's baskets that you see and are. Southwest. They're all in the southwest. There's a there's a California basket up on the top shelf. A Mono basket up on the top shelf. Um, uh, but um, that's uh, yeah. I like collecting it's a great those collection. things when I can when I can get them at a reasonable price. Yeah. Uh, so Joe, Joe Arts piped in and you briefly touched on the Glenwood locality. Do you have any highlights from your work there? And he mentions the Barber Terrace. Well, I didn't actually work at the Barber Terrace. Uh, that was one of the locations that Orr had tested when he was working there in 1938 and uh, had a map of the area that he worked on. Um, and I, I was able to geo-reference the map and I pulled out his collections and analyzed them and um, put them into broader context. And I was able to put out a, an article in the Plains Anthropologist based on that, uh, that little research project. Uh, um, I, I never actually worked on the Barber Terrace. I worked upstream from there, not all that far away, uh, uh, in, near the mouth of Pony Creek on a uh, a, a local road reconstruction project. They were replacing bridges and relocating the road in the process. And uh, that turned up quite a few sites uh, in that area. Of course, you can hardly miss at the mouth of Pony Creek, it's just archeology span wherever you want to turn. Uh, 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 I also worked um, uh, on the Culbaum property at the nor north end of the Glen locality um, uh, where there were several sites found on the Missouri bottoms, the first ones that we knew about on the Missouri bottoms proper, otherwise they're on the, up in the bluffs. Um, uh, but we never found any actually on the Missouri river bottoms themselves. And I found several of them there uh, doing that. Um, so then there was a project at the mouth of Keg Creek. Um, that's my most recent one. Um, and we, we, it was more like, more of the same. I mean, you can't put shovel to ground there without finding archaeology. So uh, uh, Glenwood has has been good to me. Uh, found and, and someone asked, I, I don't know if you know the number, but how many sites were you involved with in the Glenwood area? Oh, goodness. I, I don't try to keep track of numbers like that. Oh, <laughs> Sam. Uh, it's nice Another... to hear from Sam. Uh, you know, I sites that I've recorded myself well over, probably well over two dozen uh, um, in, in the Glenwood locality. Uh, um, but, um, uh, you know, they, they've all come on just a few projects. So uh, um, uh, most of the sites have been found by other people that I've actually worked on in, uh, uh, you know, our Highway 34 work. I, I wasn't involved with that field work. Uh, 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 there, you know, uh, I helped out on uh, 13ML102, which became part of the uh, uh, cultural resources study for the Iowa Lus Hills. Uh, we did test excavations there, and I helped out with that. Uh, somebody else had recorded that, you know, or certainly recorded a number of sites, and I've been uh, working with some of his collections and documentation. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly plenty of people have been active in that area recording sites besides me, so. Uh, yeah, and you mentioned learning new information about earth lodges, and Lance is also wondering, uh, can you summarize any of these new unusual aspects that people might not know about, some, some things that you're learning? Well, you know, we're starting to get a handle on uh, we, we know what the lodges are. They've got four central support posts and they've got a ring of 
outer wall posts and a central fire hearth and a storage pits inside, you know, usually three or four at least. Uh, um, uh, and people have mostly focused on the houses themselves and not paid a whole lot of attention to what's going on outside the houses. Uh, and I, I suspect that there was a lot of activity going on outside of these houses. Uh, um, and uh, based on the results of the Highway 34 work that we've been doing so far, uh, that seems to be the case. I mean, uh, they uh, amount uh, in the lower, well, at the Keg Creek Crossing for the new highway were several lodges uh, in a very large field, probably 10 acres. And they went through and stripped off most of that area, at least that was in the highway corridor, uh, uh, all the area around those houses had artifacts and they picked up quite a few of them. Um, there were also features which they plotted in. And um, uh, 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 so we have those locations and uh, they, they never really did anything beyond that. Um, they weren't discussed in any of the dissertation work that's been done since then. So um, we're recording new sites based on uh, those distributions of artifacts that were found uh, outside of those houses at Keg Creek. There's been other uh, excavations and such at, um, uh, that, that never found houses, but turn up all these artifacts and they must be exterior activity areas of some sort and we're still going to figure that out but we're, we're we're working on it and we're trying to get a handle on it we're, lo we're looking forward to that and there's just um a few comments so john says we owe your mom a big thank you <laughs> <laughs> for making that phone call find you some field work Sure, and then sure. Joe, Joe yeah. mentioned um, quizzing well, each think... other about uh, soil series. So on a ride back from Kansas City one time for a conference, 45 minutes oh. worth of quizzing each other about soils. <laughs> that was an enjoyable trip. <laughs> <laughs> I think That's... Hannah Grandball gets some credit for that glass of iced tea too. Yeah. <laughs> we should, yeah. And that's it for questions from from viewers. I don't know if you wanted to that's ask for today. one more, Brennan, or um, you know, Mike, I feel like I've kept in the hot seat long enough. I'm I'm okay unless there's something you think uh, you know you want to share. Uh, I'm sorry, Brennan, you were breaking up on me. I didn't hear what you were saying completely. Oh, I just said I I think I've. I've given you the question treatment today. So unless there's something you want to share, I'm good. Uh, well, I want to thank Elizabeth for organizing this. Um, and you, Brennan, again, I'm, I, I'm honored that you, you, you think highly enough of me to, to do this. And uh, um, I certainly never would have expected it. So uh, thanks for, for your time today. Well, thank you guys. I want to echo Mike's uh, uh, appreciation, Elizabeth, uh, you, is our technology coordinator or soon to be technology coordinator for the society. Um, I'm really <laughs> pleased that we were able to have this slate of offerings for folks, um, you know, particularly given the current health situation. So Elizabeth, please accept uh, my appreciation and my applause on behalf of the society. You are welcome. And of course, I just want to give you credit, Brennan, for planting the seed of this idea. Um, it is, it's been fun and also a little bit challenging to pull off, but just thoroughly enjoyable, especially uh, not many people know that I get to have practice sessions with everybody as well. And so that's just been the most fun for me is uh, just gabbing during these practice sessions when we, you know, we should be saving this stuff for the interviews, but a bunch of archeologists get together and we all just start talking and it's just been really enjoyable. So I'm sure digital outreach is going to become more of the norm going forward. So I'm hoping that we can do more of these. We certainly have 
so many archaeologists to choose from and lots of things to talk about. So thank you again to Mike and Brennan, as well as all of our participants, those who uh, stepped up to interview and those who let themselves be subjected to our interviews. So Lynn, Dave, Dave Gradwell, Dale, Dale. Hinton, yep. Joe. Yep. Joe Tiffany, and then thanks to Megan Meserol and Lance Foster uh, and Sheree Hari Arts for interviewing Joe last week, and then of course to you too. So, uh, and thanks, thanks to everybody for watching. We appreciate it. With that, we're we're signing off. All right, take care. See you guys. <laughs>